Medicine has been conducting a series of webinars for the benefits of young medical students. And uh, today, uh, we are proud to say this is our 50th live session. And it's a great pleasure having you, you here, sir. Today, Medicine, in association with Hedel and Nama Medicine, presents a step towards your desired PG, an orientation program on NEET PG Next XM for post-interns, interns, and final years from, our, from Nama uh, Surgery Legend, Dr. Rajam Hendran, sir, National Faculty for Surgery. Welcome, sir. First, Hi, good, evening. good evening, sir. First of all, I'd like to call upon Dr. Jamna Rani, ma'am. Uh, a chairman of faculty advisory uh, to give the opening remarks. So very good evening, one and all. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Raja Mahendran, sir, for this uh, webinar series in surgery. So at the outset, I would like to really thank Raja Mahendran, sir, for uh, being with us today. So uh, I would like to sir, uh, share some of my personal experience with the uh, Raja Mahendran sir, see you would have all seen his uh, uh, books. So we, uh, I belong to 2000 batch of Madras, 2001 batch of Madras Medical College, and uh, we had the privilege to see and learn from his handwritten notes actually. So all uh, sir's handwritten notes, you know, we used to take uh, photocopies, multiple photocopies will be taken and uh, uh, we don't refer any other book other than sir's notes. And uh, you know, we used to keep the notes as uh, great treasures in our hostel rooms and uh, we used to read for our uh, practical examination. So Raja Mahindran sir is such a great uh, uh, teacher and uh, he was a student leader during his uh, UG days as well. And uh, it's a great honor for all of us to host sir in our uh, medicine forum. Thank you very much for joining today, sir. Thank and you, sir. Uh, Thank you, madam. Yes, so... <laughs> Along with the students, we are also eagerly waiting to learn from you today, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much for the intro, ma'am. So, uh, thank you, Pativan. Thank you, Jamna, madam. Uh, one minute, sir. Hello. One minute. We have one more speaker. Uh, yes, I sincerely call upon Dr. Ramananda, uh, Raghunandan Ramanandan, sir, founder and chairperson of medicine, to give his opening remarks. Thank you so much, sir, for joining with us today. I think uh, I'm just, uh, you are just following me for uh, when I first asked, you are readily agreed and you are just keeping on updating me when you will be free. Thank you so much for joining us today, sir. Amid your busy schedule, I know that you are also taking lots of classes and I'm also eagerly waiting for your class in Chennai. So to introduce sir, uh, Rajamahendran sir is a senior assistant professor in Department of Surgical Gastroenterology in Government uh, Vilipram Medical College. He is a multifaceted personality, I would say, because uh, I'll right from the beginning, like he is serving as an inspiration to me as well as many students, because right from the UG days, he is uh, writing notes and he is trying to publish and benefit students. And the ultimate aim of medicine itself is like sharing the knowledge and within among ourselves and to share the knowledge which we acquire from different faculties with others. So with that motto, I too started this and sir serves as an inspiration in that. Thank you so much, sir, for joining with us today. And I think uh, he is the right person for everyone to know what is a strategy to prepare for your entrance exam. And also regarding the next exam, which is upcoming, uh, which is actually a buzz among the final year of MBBS students also. So right from the final year MBBS, how to start preparing from the for NEET or next or whatever entrance exam it, it may be. So sir will be the right person to guide you all. And today you will all have a great idea at the end of this session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu, for inviting me for the session. Thank you so much. So, uh, without wasting much of time, we'll go to the session directly. Uh, today's session is uh, totally a session related to how to prepare for the next. So because most of the students are preparing for NEET PG, some of you are preparing for final MBBS university exams. So the next, the next exam is going to be a little different. Uh, it is not going to be a theory exam or it is not going to be a fact-based exam, but it is going to be an exam which will be helping you uh, to learn clinical skill from your final MBBS period itself, from understanding the method of uh, exam in next 
I am sure you all will be an excellent clinician because the question pattern and the approach, everything as per NMC curriculum is in such a way, it gives more importance to the clinical uh, Okay. So this session will hope will be an eye-opening session for most of the final MBBS students who are preparing for the final year with the confusion whether there will be next or final MBBS theory exam. So if it is going to be a, a next pattern exam, only five subjects are going to play an important role. You all know about the five subjects which are going to have an important role in next. So please remember the subjects which we will be having for next will be uh, number one, medicine. So the subject which is going to have the huge weightage is medicine, no doubt in that. So as per the next curriculum, what they have given previous year, they, we will be getting a clear idea in next one month, but medicine will be having 120 questions. This is the first important thing you should not forget. Surgery will be having 120 questions. And OBG will be having 120 questions. So please understand one important thing. Medicine means it will not be only pure medicine from your Davidson or from your surgery from your Bailey and Love or OBG from your Datta. It is going to be applied medicine. Applied medicine will include all the basic science subjects like anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, path, form, micro. So no need to go and read them in a theory oriented way. But now when you are reading surgery, for example, if you are reading surgery, how you have to give importance to the basic science subject only we are going to discuss in this session number one and these are the three important subjects what are the other important subjects means i will say medicine surgery obg so in the list they have missed ortho but maybe ortho in surgery is included in ortho ortho anesthesia radiology so these three subjects will be coming under surgery and allied subjects in medicine you will be getting the following subjects so medicine you'll be getting um, very important like psychiatry, skin, okay. psychiatry, skin will be included in uh, medicine. And apart from that, you will also have the basic science subjects which might be prepared from your clinical book. So no need to go for a basic science book. All the basic science points will be there in medicine book and surgery book and OBG book. And what are the other subjects which are given other uh, importance are? They are saying pediatrics will be given 60 marks. ENT will be given 60 marks. Aptal will be given 60 marks. So this is not a standard confirmed criteria, but this is what they released some months back. So pediatrics will be having 60, ENT will be having 60, Aptal will be having 60 questions. All this also will be same applied based on anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, etc. And the SPM will be added. Statistics related question will be added in any of these parts. Around 10% of the questions will be from statistics. So from here, now you can see in final year, you all will be very serious with the following five subjects. So medicine, surgery, OBG, pediatrics, ortho. These are the five subjects we will be focusing more during your final year period, I, during for your theory exam. So same five subjects focus more depth. So ENT optal, when next is confirmed, we can add that because you all would have cleared already ENT optal in your university exam. By chance, if next is going to contain ENT, Optal and SPM, you can prepare these three subjects near exam, near one month or one and a half months before exam. You can prepare them in an MCQ oriented way. So at this point of time, I request final years to focus more on orthopedic subject, medicine, surgery, OG and pediatrics. These five subjects play an important role both for your university exam as well as for your uh, next exam. So let me tell how the questions will be coming in surgery. Let us start with a few pattern model questions, which are going to be the next pattern questions. See the question. Mr. Kumar, 34 years male, was operated for thyroid nodule. Okay, he was operated for a thyroid nodule. During the surgery, which of the following energy device must not be used near the vessels? So very interesting point. Near the vessels, you all know there will be nerves. So near the vessels, there will be so much of nerves near the vessels. Um, you should not use which energy device in this list? It's a very simple question. You should not use monopolar diathermy. Let me explain you that. So this is a picture showing you, a video showing you, a monopolar diathermy being used here. Deeper, deeper, it's not, it's it's a monopolar diathermy, which will have lateral spread of heat. So when you use it near the vessels, there will be so many nerves around the thyroid. You all will be reading that in your clinical topics that may injure the nerves. So this monopolar diathermy should not be used. And this is bipolar diathermy, which can be used because there will be no lateral spread of energy in the tip. 
the current only passes between the two tips whereas in a monopolar diathermy there will be lateral spread of energy and you may injure the nerves which will result in the future uh, neuro neuropraxia or paralysis or even cutting of the nerve can happen with the monopolar diathermy so please understand now let me tell you what all will be done during a thyroid surgery so during thyroid surgery you will be reading in thyroid clinical case discussion also about the thyroid vessels which are ligated so this is superior thyroid artery which enters the thyroid gland then only it gives branches superior thyroid artery which is a branch of external carotid artery and this is inferior thyroid artery which branches before entering the thyroid gland far away from inferior thyroid artery comes from thyrocervical trunk it is a branch from thyrocervical trunk it gives a, a small branches before it enters now you should know what happens if superior thyroid artery has a very close relation of this nerve so this is external laryngeal nerve so very close to superior thyroid artery inferior thyroid artery has a very close association of this nerve this is recurrent laryngeal nerve so old concept was we have to prevent to prevent the injury of the nerves we will ligate superior thyroid artery close to the gland inferior thyroid artery away from the gland is a old concept new bailey has very clearly modified it we should not ligate inferior thyroid, inferior thyroid artery away from the gland because inferior thyroid artery is only one which supplies the parathyroid glands now we are giving more importance to parathyroid glands than the nerve so parathyroid glands can get loss of blood supply if you ligate it very far away therefore new concept is ligate the inferior thyroid vessels individually small branches close to the gland and carefully preserve the recurrent laryngeal nerve so this is what i'm telling when i'm trying to use ligation of these vessels i should not use monopolar diathermy i can use bipolar diathermy okay bipolar can be used monopolar should not be used in thyroid and harmonic scalpel can be used because it will not have a lateral spread of energy to the nerves so please don't forget which is not used in in a, in a which energy device should not be used in thyroid surgery very close to nerves answer is monopolar diathermy that's what we saw in the uh, video which i showed you just now so this is how the question will be so you have to understand a concept you should understand what is being done practically so previously if it is an mcq what will be asked the previous questions will be uh, uh, which will which of the uh, uh, which nerve will be injured in superior thyroid artery uh, ligation which nerve will be injured in inferior thyroid artery ligation where will you ligate like that there will be questions very simply superficial so here after a superficial reading will not work out in next when you are going for next you should read each and every topic in depth so you can see though i am taking a surgery class here i have discussed applied anatomy here so you can see this is what i am saying applied anatomy what i am saying is apply it at this point of time you have to take your anatomy books or you have to read about anatomy given in surgery books so here i am telling very clearly superior thyroid artery is a branch of external carotid artery inferior thyroid artery is a branch of thyrocervical trunk and recurrent laryngeal nerve is very closely related to inferior thyroid artery external laryngeal nerve very closely related to superior thyroid artery so like that you when you are reading a surgical topic you should be thorough with the anatomy also that is what going to help you very very uh, very much during your next preparation okay next exam preparation is like reading like a line not like a cow what is a cow do cow used to uh, eat the grass from morning to night slowly it will keep on uh, chewing 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 it won't fully digest it will keep on chewing all the time where you see lion lion will eat three three days once only it will take a, a deer or some rabbit and it will eat fully without leaving even small amount of bone it completely clears the body of a deer so after eating it will be taking rest for three or four days such a way you have to read if you start reading there is no use of superficial reading you have to go for a in depth reading read to the depth read the concepts up to the depth that is a concept that is a, a, a principle needed for next preparation so let us see so next is having an advantage or not means i will say it is having a huge advantage because you are not going to read fact based questions unwantedly you are not going to mug up facts so you can answer next question only when you understand a concept if you if you practically see the concept if you practically learn those things you can answer the next exam question so definitely for final mbbs students it is going to be a, a huge advantage okay mr ramu 
55 years male was inserted a rice tube by house surgeon. See, very commonly, you will be doing so many work in house agency period. So many questions are coming based on what you do during your residency. To know the position of the tip is in the stomach, which is the ideal method. So to know, we have put the rice tube into the stomach. What are the ideal method? So push gas and listen to the stethoscope. This is what we commonly do, but it is not the ideal method. What we do? Putting the rice tube, we push a gas and see for the sound using a stethoscope. Not to be done. It is not the ideal method. You can do, but it is not the ideal method. Aspirate, choose green in color. That is also not a correct method. Aspirate the gastric juice and test for pH. We take X-ray chest. So all these are done, but ideal method is to check for pH. Using a litmus paper, you have to test for pH. So this is a nasogastric tube known as Riles tube. Now, when you're reading Riles tube, Riles tube is such a common topic. You have to know everything about it in depth. Nasogastric tube. Let me tell you the basic points about this tube. How to know what is the ideal length of rice tube needed for a person? Okay, if there is a person like this. This is a patient. So this patient, how to know what is the ideal length of rice tube I should use for him? For that, there is a rule known as next rule. Because everyone is not of same height. Different people have different height. For that, what we will you do? Nose to ear. Take a tape. Measure from nose to ear. Ear to zippy sternum. You. This is known as next rule. So nose. Ear, Ziffy sternum. This is the rule used for next rule. So next rule is used to identify the ideal length of Riles tube. And the Riles tube is inserted through the nose into the stomach. The patient in what position usually it is done? What is the ideal position? You, you will be doing in many positions. What is an ideal position? Ideal position is neck flexed. Okay, neck flexed sitting position. This is the ideal position. Sitting with the neck flexed is an ideal position to insert a Riles tube. To insert a Riles tube, sitting with neck flexed is an ideal position to put a Riles tube. And once the Riles tube is in the stomach, we have to confirm the tip is there in the stomach by testing for pH of aspirate. pH of aspirate in a litmus paper should be checked, checked out for acidity. Okay. Litmus paper will tell you whether it is an alkaline or acid. So if it is showing acidity, it is a case of uh, clear cut case of acid pH. Okay, that is another method. Now, if I am putting a Riles tube in a newborn baby, let me tell you so a few MCQs. Newborn baby, I am passing Riles tube through the nose, but it is coming out through the mouth. We call it as coiling of Riles tube. Where, which condition you get this coiling of Riles tube? Can you tell me in which condition? When I pass a Riles tube, it doesn't go to the stomach. It comes out through the mouth. It is seen in tracheoesophageal fistula. Please remember, very important. So very, very uh, high yield topics, all the high yield topics should be thorough like a fingertip. So I'm not, in fact, I'm not taking 100% everything needed for the topic. Just I'm giving you an idea how to prepare. So coiling of Riles tube is happening because of congenital tracheoesophageal fistula. And when I pass a Riles tube, it goes to the chest in which condition? In a baby who is having breathlessness, I'm putting a Riles tube. The Riles tube is the tip is seen in the chest on an X-ray. This is a case of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So congenital diaphragmatic hernia, the Riles tube will enter the chest. Piling of Riles tube is seen in tracheoesophageal fistula. So like that, many important MCQs are there from this nasogastric tube. So please don't forget. So one of the best position is this position, Fowler's position, sitting with the neck flexed. Sitting with neck flexed is an ideal position for putting a Riles tube. So what is ideal position to put a Riles tube? Is sitting with the neck flexed, which we call it as Fowler's like position. Okay. So this is a pH. We have to test for acidic pH. You can see the color of the tissue paper will show you whether it is an acidic pH or an alkaline pH. So you can use these papers to test the aspirate. So that will help you to find out it. Okay. Um, the Saran MBBS is asking, will 2019 batch will have next trip? So final university exam, there will be no final university exam. That is what the stocks going on for the past many days. So definitely we'll be knowing by this month and they, they have announced, they will be announcing it. So there is no university exam for final year. For final year, there will be only next exam like this. What we are discussing, no, exams will be like this in all subjects. Every day I'm getting tired after my duty. I'm current intern. I have no hopes regarding my preparation. 
So please remember, Kola uh, uh, Bola is asking, very difficult in the internship. See, please, please remember one important thing. PG preparation is not something different. It starts from your ward learning. So what you learn in the ward is going to help you. So please remember, whatever you learn in ward is actually a PG preparation only, especially when next is going to come. Whatever you learn in what, every day you are going to learn 20 to 30 MCQs practically only. So don't get frustrated. Whatever you are seeing there, ask the postgraduates there some important points, uh, so related MCQ points, or some clinical aspects. You ask from the uh, postgraduates, junior residents who are there, definitely they will help you about how to prepare. Okay, seniors, whoever there, like SR will be there, PGs will be there, or some assistant professors will be there, will be helping you during your what time. Okay. So next, next coming to another one question, Mrs. Kumari, a case of short bubble syndrome was inserted this catheter. See, since you're asking, sir, I'm unable to get uh, preparation during my house agency period. This is what we ask that expect you to learn during your house agency period, because during your residency, whatever you are touching, whatever you are seeing, whatever you are carrying, everything is having 10 to 20 MCQs, which is ex 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 exactly of next pattern questions. I'm sure you will be seeing this at least from 50 to 60 case during your resident period this is central vein catheter three lumen central vein catheter in a short bubble syndrome patient who is going to be on tpn for a long period i am going to put this central vein catheter which is the best vein to insert the catheter yes anybody answering i'm watching on the youtube for your chat if you have any doubts you can post there or if you want anything to be clarified you can post there in the chat box this is not a teaching session just an orientation session towards next preparation. Okay. This is just an orientation session towards next preparation. So let me discuss about central vein catheter now. See central vein catheter. So it is just like an flan. When flan we will be putting in the peripheral veins. This is a central vein catheter, which is only inserted in the central veins. What are the central veins we can insert? Means internal jugular vein, subclavian vein, femoral vein. So internal jugular vein, subclavian vein, femoral vein, all these are central veins we'll be using for inserting a catheter. So in this catheter, if you see, there are three lumens from the picture. You saw three lumens in the picture. So why, why we have three lumens, this central lumen catheter, central vein catheter is inserted in the central vein. Why should I have three lumens? So one lumen is for measuring CVP, central venous pressure. Another lumen is for taking samples. No need to prick the... Uh, veins every time to take blood sample. Sample collection can be done through one vein and another vein is used for giving antibiotics or IV fluids or whatever you are going to inject to the patient will be given through another lumen. That is why it is three lumen. So three lumen central vein catheter is used for uh, different purposes. Here question is asking in case of short bubble syndrome, what is this short bubble syndrome? Short bubble syndrome is a condition in which we have done resection of the small bubble and the patient is having very less amount of small bubble remaining and the length of small bubble remaining is less than 200 centimeter so that patients may need then total parental nutrition for many, many days. For giving TPN for many days, we cannot give through peripheral vein because if I give through peripheral vein, there will be peripheral vein thrombosis will happen. That is why we are opting for central vein. So please remember central vein is a root of choice for which all cases. Central vein is a root of entry for chemotherapy. It is a root of entry for chemotherapy. It is a root of entry for chemotherapy. It is a root of entry for TPN. It is a root of entry for chemotherapy, TPN and these are because these chemotherapy or TPN we cannot give through peripheral vein, patient will develop thrombophlebitis. So, therefore, in these cases, we will use the central vein like IJV, subclavian vein, and femoral vein will be used in those cases. So, central vein is now the three routes which we commonly use are this is internal jugular vein and this is subclavian vein root. So, you all know subclavian vein will be inserted here just below the clavicle. Below the midpoint of the clavicle, we will insert the subclavian vein, central vein. Internal jugular vein is inserted between the two heads of sternocleidomastoid. So many times as residents, you will be getting chances to put central vein catheter. So please do central vein cathetering, IJV, subclavian vein. Wherever you are putting, the tip should remain where. Where should be the tip of the catheter? That is again another MCQ. So the tip of catheter should be remaining in the 
SVC, it should not go to the atrium. Please remember, the tip should be in the SVC. It should not go to the atrium. Why? If it is in the atrium, thrombus will form here. Thrombus, thrombus can form in the atrium. So how to know whether I am in the SVC or in the, in the atrium? Here comes a very important investigation. After putting the central vein catheter, you must immediately take X-ray chest. If you are doing under an ultrasound guidance, you can find out where we are going. So ultrasound guidance is now recent update. All the central vein catheters are now inserted with an ultrasound guidance. If you are inserting under ultrasound guidance, the risk of injuries are less. But if it is not available, don't worry. You can put the central vein catheter followed by a X-ray chest to know the tip in SVC number one. Another important reason for a chest X-ray is we have to rule out pneumothorax. This is a typical next question. So the question will be like in such a way, a patient had a central vein catheter done. He develops breathlessness in the, in the ward after putting a central vein catheter. What should you do next? Immediately, I should take an X-ray chest and I should rule out pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is a dangerous complication. We have seen patients who died of pneumothorax following a central vein catheter. So be careful. We have to always take X-ray chest after doing a central vein catheter to know the tip in SVC and to rule out pneumothorax. There are so many more points from central vein catheter, but please remember, these are our basic points, which are more practical points. You should never forget these practical points. And central venous catheter, uh, the most common complication of inserting the central vein catheter is dash. So most common complication is we may accidentally injure the artery nearby. Arterial puncture is the most common complication. Most dangerous complication is pneumothorax. Please don't forget. So pneumothorax is most commonly seen with subclavian vein. So now the question is asking, which vein will you use for a long-term short bubble syndrome patient means the most comfortable vein for long-term is subclavian vein. So if I want to put a long-term nutrition, I will put a subclavian vein because patient can put a shirt and he can go for his routine work by putting a subclavian vein catheter. So IJV is used only in trauma patients, in trauma cases and for short-term nutrition. Or short-term, we use IJV. Long-term, we use subclavian vein catheter. So please don't forget the use of central vein catheter. Okay. So many questions are there. You have to know, you read about each and everything. What you see in your ward is having an MCQ, having a concept for exam. Okay. How many of you have gone for blood bank? So many times you would have run for blood bank. How many of you know there are 200 MCQs from blood bank alone? The moment you go for blood bank, carry a blood, come back to the ward and transfuse a blood, patient developing complication with all these things, there are around 200 MCQs you can get from a blood bank. So that is why I'm telling you, learning is not from books. The next is going to come, you're going to learn the next exam from the ward. That is what the examiner's purpose. The examiners have an intention to make you all learn from the ward and apply things from the ward itself instead of learning from online or from offline classes. The next exam will definitely uh, a major changeover for all the MBBS students to learn the clinical aspects more deeper. Okay, So Mr. Anuj, 23 years male, met with a massive road traffic accident. BP 80 by 50, pulse rate 120. House surgeon runs to blood bank to get two units of packed red cells. We don't have time to do cross-matching. Which blood group will you prefer for him? 23 years male. So can we give an idea? What is the answer for this question? So what is the uh, blood group should be transfused for a 23 years male? O negative, O positive, AB negative, AB positive. Because I don't have a time. Patient is getting very sicker and sicker. I cannot wait for um, the, uh, the cross-matching. I will immediately do a blood transfusion with which group of blood? That is the question. So now, so you should remember here in trauma, in trauma, we don't have time for blood cross matching. It will take 45 minutes to do cross matching, especially if it is a major injury, patient is getting very sick. We have to do transfusion in the ratio of one is to one is to one protocol. What is this one is to one is to one protocol? First of all, please remember, we never transfuse packed red blood cell only. We will transfuse packed red blood cell, platelets, and plasma in the ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1. This is the ratio. If what is mean by massive blood transfusion means in 24 hours, you have done 10 units of 
packed red blood cell 10 units of platelets 10 units of plasma if you have done 10 units of platelets plasma prbc that is known as massive transfusion so whatever it is initially we have no time for doing cross matching if nothing is mentioned universal blood which can be infused is o negative no doubt in that so here comes the way why we are telling you how to read like a line not like a cow so one o negative is a correct answer no doubt in that but next exam will not be such an easier exam so in this question you have to note there is a point from Bailey and Love. Latest update, Bailey and Love says, in male patients, post-reproductive female patients, males and post-reproductive female patients, we have to give O positive. Please remember, O negative is a very rare group. We should not waste the blood. So male patients and post-reproductive female patients, we will use O positive. This is the latest update from uh, Bailey. You know, yes, O negative will be used when nothing is mentioned in the question. But in the question, it is mentioned, Mr. Anuj, 25 years male. So you should go for O positive according to ATLS latest edition in Bailey and Love. So this is the correct answer for this question. So O negative is universal and reproductive age female. If Mr. Anuj is a female, Mr. Anuj, so definitely it, she is a reproductive female. We will go for O negative. So this is very important because to avoid RH incompatibility in reproductive females, we will give O negative. So this is these are all the points you should know. In blood bank, there are 100 questions. I can take a blood bank topic alone for four hours. But please remember, this is a basic point you should know from this question. So just I'm giving some orientation for how to prepare for next exam. So yes, Prashant, that is what the discussion is going on about how the exam will be, how the questions will be, how you have to modify your preparation for university exam to next pattern MCQ based, uh, clinical MCQ based exam. That is the concept of this small session. See, many questions will come from image based. I'm telling you, you know, there will be so many questions will be coming from image based. So this is an excellent image already asked in AIMS. So in AIMS, this is what they use for regularly for blood transfusion, which we might not see in our uh, state medical colleges for blood transfusion. What is this? Mrs. Rani was about to be transfused blood. The blood bank medical officer gives this tube to the CRRI for transfusion of the blood. What is the use of this? What is this? This is a special set used for blood transfusion so i'm that's why i'm telling you blood transfusion will have so many questions what is the most common complication of blood transfusion anybody can tell me what is the most common complication of blood transfusion it is please don't forget the moment you do a blood transfusion you can see many patients developing acute febrile reaction why this reactions develop in many patients acute febrile reactions so acute febrile reaction due to non-hemolytic, these are not due to wrong class match. It is non-hemolytic. What is the most common cause of this acute non-hemolytic blood transfusion is due to leukocytes, due to WBC present in the sample. Due to the WBC in the blood, they develop acute non-hemolytic reaction. So these patients, acute non-hemolytic, this is because of the WBC present in the donor blood. This can be filtered by this filter. That is what the IV set you are seeing here is leukocyte reduction filter. So many questions will come from practical images, practical what things will be, you will be asked so many questions. Leukocyte reduction filter is the filter used for filtering such type of WBC so that you will have no such reaction. To, what we will do in our hospitals, any patient we are doing a transfusion, immediately we will put avil decadron to prevent this reaction. But actually this is available that will prevent WPC induced reactions. Okay. See now coming to the another question. See all questions in next will be practical, practical, practical. This is another question based on Foley's catheter. So how many cases you will see putting a Foley's catheter? There again, are around 20 to 30 questions from Foley's catheter alone. Mr. Monusami, 65 years male, had an acute urinary retention, presence to casualty. Postgraduate inserted a Foley's 16 French size, inflated the balloon with a normal saline. So every word is important. 
he has used a wrong solution to inflate. What is the solution that should be used to inflate? It should not be normal saline. It should be a, yes? Uh, hypocalcemia is not the common complication, right? This uh, one of massive blood transfusion patients will develop hypocalcemia. This, this patient, normal saline infused is wrong. They should infuse distilled water. Okay, distilled water should be used. But he has used a normal saline. Now the patient came back after 45 days and you are trying to deflate the balloon. You are unable to deflate. This is a very common complication because of this type of uh, normal saline being used. What will you do to remove the tube? Cut the foleys and remove. Over inflate the tube and rupture. Under ultrasound guidance, puncture the balloon. Push sodium bicarbonate inside. What is the wrong answer? Which, what's the correct answer here? How to remove the uh, very good KKN? That's correct. Sterile water, distilled water should be used. What is the correct method to remove such retained foleys? This is a complication known as retained foleys. The correct answer is under ultrasound guidance, you must puncture this balloon. So you have to inflate this balloon with the distilled water. And if it is not getting deflated under ultrasound guidance, put a needle puncture into this. The distilled water will leak into the bladder and you can easily remove the tube. Okay, that is a classical point here. So here in this, you can see there is different color coding in each catheter you are seeing here. So this is again a repeat, repeat MCQ. In males, we use this orange catheter. Please remember, orange is used in males, adult males. It is what size? It is 16 French size. So orange is used in males, it is 16 French size. So in girls, in females, girls, you use green color catheter green coded catheter it is only 14 french size if i want to give bladder wash or bladder irrigation i should use a high uh, I sh you have to use red red is 18 french which is the biggest size is 18 french which will be used for irrigation purpose this is mainly used to irrigate and wash the bladder we use this three-way type of catheter with the 18 French. So orange, 16 French for males and girls green, 14 French, red for 18 French is for irrigating the bladder and wash. Okay. So this is the color coding will also be asked for your exam. So you should especially know these three colors, green, orange, red. This French, French is a unit for catheters. What is this French means? French is the meaning outer diameter of the catheter. What is French stands for? French stands for outer diameter of catheter. If this is the catheter outer diameter, you have to measure this is the French units. One French is equal to 0.33 millimeters. Please don't forget this formula. So one French is equal to 0.33 millimeters and one French is equal to the French is a unit corresponds to outer diameter of the catheter. So there are two types of catheter. What you are seeing here is a silicon catheter and this is a latex catheter. What we see in our hospitals are mostly latex rubber catheters which will have more allergy and more uh, irritation of the urinary pathway. So it should be removed every maximum. Remove it in 30 days. Don't keep it more than 30 days. Silicon catheter can be kept for 90 days. So maximum period of latex rubber catheter is 30 days. Usually we remove in 50 days. Silicon catheter can be retained up to 90 days also. So these are many questions are there from the Foley's catheter. So and similarly, we have so many questions from the suture materials. So I'm telling you, know, if you go to operation theater, if you go to the ward, you observe what is happening there daily for 10 days to 15 days. If you observe, you can answer 50% of the next pattern questions without mugging up the facts from the book. That is a that is the speciality of this next exam. I'm telling you, you know, 120, next question, 60 questions, everybody can answer if you have gone to the ward and you have seen the patients. Of the 120 surgery questions, 60 questions you will answer exactly correct. Okay. So after gastrectomy surgery by the chief, the CRRI is given chance to suture the skin. CRRI is suturing, the, suturing by the following technique. This is known as DASH technique. What is it? So you can see we are taking suture here, 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 here. This is a technique of horizontal mattress. But understanding suture is very well done in operation yes, theater. Now you see, material. So I'm showing you a simple suture. To do a skin material. suture, we are using a needle folder, two, three forceps, and a straight scissor. Now you're using a simple suture. 
Yes, Either okay. side, I have taken sutures and I am doing a knotting. This is a simple technique. Yes, simple simple suture. suture, just approximating on either side. Three knots we yes, make yes. for silk. Yes, this yes. is a simple suture done here. So now you can see the vertical now, mattress. On I am going deeper on one side. I will be coming very it's deeper. Another side. side also, we will be going deeper. And now at the same level, I will come superficially. You can see now. We are coming superficially like this. So now we are coming superficially like this. You can see that skin is getting approximated very well. So you can see the vertical mattress suture. This is a vertical mattress suture. You are seeing here is a vertical mattress suture. That is a vertical mattress suture. That is a vertical mattress. Yes. No, what I am putting is, this is known as vertical mattress sutures. So now you are seeing an horizontal mattress suture. So this is a suture showing you here is horizontally. The same level we will take horizontally. You can see, I am taking on the same side, same level. See, for demonstration purpose, for a same patient, I have done different type of sutures. But practically, you can do only one type of suture first thing. No need to do all sutures for all patients. So just for demonstration purpose, I have done simple vertical mattress and horizontal mattress for your so, the horizontal mattress suture. And this is another suture which is running subcuticular, which is not seen outside. This is done with the help of monocryl, okay, polyglyc caprone. Is used for suturing this. This is done with the help of, Lighting. but what I'm using here is vicryl. What I'm using here is vicryl, which is polyglactic acid. But the people use nowadays monocryl, which is called by people as white vicryl. It is polyglycaprone. Polyglycaprone is monocryl. Okay. So like that suture materials, you should be knowing the suture materials, suture techniques, everything you should know. And all the instruments used in the operation that you will be knowing. You are a CRRI assisting a gallbladder surgery. The senior resident asks you to take a retractor and retract the liver. So you can tell me which is the correct answer. A, B, C, D. There are four retractors shown here. Which is used specifically for liver retraction in this list? Which retractor is used for liver retraction? So this is Devers. The first one is known as Devers retractor. It is having a long long blade okay and the second one is maris maris is having a short blade very short blade this is well known c is well known langenbach langenbach c d is zerni zerni's retractor is d this is zerni langenbach maris divas which is used for um, Liver retraction, the correct answer is Devers. Devers is a retractor used for liver retraction. So instrument-based questions will be there in next exam. You have to know all the surgical instruments, all the obstetrics instruments, all the medical uh, needles and all which are used. Everything you should know for exam, which you can learn practically by seeing in the ward. Okay. So another thing in the operation theater is about the position of the patients. In what position you will put the... Uh, patient during surgery because the position is a very important assistant in the OT. So what is the complication on operating a patient in this procedure for a long time? So when I'm operating a case, this is a position we do on surgery that is a pylonidal sinus. We will operate in this position. Pylonidal sinus surgery is done in this position and this is known as jackknife position. Prone jackknife position is used as a pylonidal position, pylonidal sinus position. What is the complication which can happen? Yes. So many of you are not answering in the chat box. I think you can see, you can answer in the chat box. You are seeing around 27 students are watching online. So what is this position shown here? This is a jackknife position. The position done here is can cause positional asphyxia, positional asphyxia. So please remember you have to know the positions used in the operation theater and the various complications of such positions. We should know about the thing. Okay. So this position, what is the name of this position of OT table? This is foot is up, head is down. What is this position? This is Trenlenburg position. Trenlenburg position for operating. So this is position used for varicose vein surgery. So each position you, you should know what surgery is done and what is the complication which can happen. So varicose vein operation is done in this Trenlenburg position. Varicose vein, the foot end is up 
and head end is down and this patient will not have any complication specifically. There is no complication mentioned in this position. So Trendlenburg is a position, head down position, no complication mentioned in this. But jackknife position for pilonidal sinus, positional asphyxia can happen. Okay. So very good, Grace. It's a Trendlenburg. You can see this is a reverse Trendlenburg. So this is a position of reverse Trendlenburg. All surgeries in the head and neck. By putting this position, the veins here will collapse. So I can do a thyroid surgery, parotid surgery, head and neck surgery. All the head and neck surgeries are done in this position. So can you tell me what complication can happen in this position? Because the veins are collapsed, if there is a small opening, that can suck the blood inside, that can suck the blood inside, sorry, the air inside and it can cause air embolism is a complication seen in this reverse Trendlenburg position. So this is a very commonly done lithotomy position for all pelvic surgeries and hemorrhoids, normal uh, vaginal delivery, everything is done in this lithotomy position will be helpful for uh, episiotomy suturing everything. But the point you should remember here is this position can cause because of chronic compression in this popliteal fossa level, there may be a problem. That problem is common peroneal nerve can get injured. That is why we should give keep good sponges below the uh, popliteal fossa. Otherwise, common peroneal nerve can be injured in lithotomy position. Very good. So this is again a Fowler's position, which I already told you. Fowler's position, sitting with neck flexor. You can see sitting with neck flexor position. This position is used for neurosurgeries. And this can cause air embolism. Air embolism can happen in this position. Air embolism happens in this position. So let us see some another questions from uh, gastro. See this question. Uh, Miss Ramya, 20 years female, presented with dysphagia, also gives history of weight loss past two years. Barium swallow was then shows abrupt cutoff of contrast. So this is again a classical clinical question. So you will not be asked an essay question to write, explain about achalasia. They won't ask you to uh, explain about a detailed procedure of achalasia cardia. They won't ask you, but they will be asking you a question related by, to achalasia by giving a clue. See, now let me tell you what is the difference between achalasia and a cancer in presentation history and from the findings. Achalasia in esophagus, cancer in esophagus. Please know the difference because this is what you have to know. So for a next exam, you may not mug up everything, but you have to understand the facts. Achalasia is a disease of young female. So in the history, there will be an young female given. CA esophagus is a history of old male. Old male. Achalasia will have a long history of dysphagia. Long history means more than six months, they will have history of dysphagia. Whereas CA esophagus will come to you with a short history of dysphagia, less than six months history. Very fast, rapidly progressing dysphagia is seen in CA esophagus. In achalasia, there is a dysphagia for both solids and liquids. More for what? More for liquids. Whereas in CA esophagus, dysphagia is more for solids. How you can make notes from your materials from your textbook is given here so this is how you have to prepare contents comparing the two topics so dysphagia is more for liquids in achalasia and more for solids in ca esophagus in cancer esophagus it will be more for solids in achalasia the patients will have physiological constriction of lower esophageal sphincter like this so this is a physiological lower esophageal increased tone <clears throat> the, in, the pressure in this will be very high. Lower esophageal pressure is very high. <clears throat> so it is not opening up. So it is not opening up. Therefore, the fluid gets collected above this LES. Therefore, the fluid gets collected about this. Therefore, the patient is unable to eat or drink better. So this is a case of classical achalasia. Whereas in a cancer, what happens? There is a hard growth, which is occluding the lumen like this. So there is a hard cancer occluding the lumen like this. So nothing will go, especially when it is a solid, it cannot go inside. Liquids can slowly pass between the gap, but this will be having a cancer grown like this. So now if I take bariums, both of them, what is the investigation of choice means? Investigation of choice for achalasia is high resolution manometry. That is a gold standard investigation to diagnose achalasia. 
where his investigation of choice for cancer is by doing a endoscopy and biopsy. Endoscopic biopsy. But as MBBS graduates, you will not be having all these things during your practice or during your residency time. So what we will do, easily done investigations are barium swallow. A barium swallow in Achalasia will show you a classical bird's beak appearance like this. This is a bird's beak appearance. So abrupt cutoff, that is known as bird's beak appearance or abrupt cutoff. And CA esophagus will have irregular narrowing of the esophagus. Irregular narrowing. Irregular narrowing. And this rat tail appearance is a term misused for both. It is used in both that, both in achalasia it is used and it is in cancer also it is used. But correct answer, what we surgeons use is abrupt cutoff. That is the answer. We don't like these funny terms. These funny terms are kept by radiologists for, uh, for attraction purpose. Otherwise, this is an abrupt cutoff of contrast. You can see this is an abrupt cutoff of contrast here. No contrast goes beyond that. So this is an achalasia. Whereas in a cancer, there is no abrupt cutoff. There is irregular narrowing scene. Okay. So on endoscopy, we will have so many interesting findings. 30 years old, Mr. Gupta, HIV positive patient presented to hospital with the complaints of odinophagia. Endoscopy showed the following five diagnosis. What is your diagnosis? So what you are seeing in this endoscopy picture? So in this endoscopy picture, you are seeing a curdy white patch. Curdy white patch is a classical of candidiasis. So please don't forget. So each of them will have a classical finding on endoscopy. So endoscopic findings in infection, candidiasis, you will have candidiasis, you will have curdy white patch. Curdy white patch is seen in candidiasis. Herpes simplex virus, all these are seen in HIV patients, immunocompromised patients, you will have candidiasis, herpes simplex, cytomegalovirus. Three infections are seen in immunocompromised patients. Three of them have three MCQs in endoscopy. Herpes simplex virus will have punched out ulcer. Cytomegalovirus will have serpentine ulcer. Serpentine ulcer in endoscopy. Punched out ulcer in endoscopy in herpes simplex virus. So endoscopic findings of various ulcers can come as image-based question as well as as theory-based question. So punched out ulcer is seen in herpes simplex. Cytomyelovirus will have serpentine ulcer. Candidiasis will have curdy white patch. These are three patients with a HIV who may have immunocompromised related findings. So this finding is a case of candidiasis shown in the picture. Okay. So let us have one more question. Last question for discussion. Mr. Ramu, 40 years male, presented with a fever and chill. See, these are the classical clinical questions. So they will be giving a patient name. They will be giving an age. Everything is important. Name, age, clinical symptoms like fever and chills. And they will be giving lab investigation. So next approach will be name will be given. Age will be given. Clinical features will be given. Investigation finding will be given. And they will be asking you about the management. Sometimes they will stop at clinical features and I will ask you the investigation. So next is classically next. What will you do next? Okay. So serum bilirubin is 10 milligrams. Normal value is only one. Here it is 10. Ultrasound showed stones in the CBD. What is the immediate next step in the management? So what is the ultrasound showing stone in the CBD? What is the immediate next step? Classical point in a patient who is having a ultrasound showed stones in the CBD. What will you do next? Answer is ERCP and stone removal. Okay, This is a very classical point. Patient is coming to you with a bile duct obstruction. So this is a bile duct. The bile duct is obstructed by a stone. So there is a stone obstructing bile duct. Because of stone obstructing, he is getting bile collected in the biliary pathway. And gallbladder is also having multiple stones now. So now the patient is having a triad. What is a triad given in the, in the question? That is known as Charcot's triad. Charcot's triad is characterized by pain plus jaundice plus fever. This is a classical triad of Charcot's. If you have to immediately remove the stone and let out the jaundice. Very good. Therefore, I should immediately go for an ERCP using a side viewing scopy. I will go to the ampulla ERCP, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography plus sphincterotomy plus stone removal 
will be done for this patient. So once I remove the stone, the bile will get drained and the fever, jaundice, everything will get relieved and we will keep a stent during this procedure. So ERCP, sphincterotomy, stone removal and stenting is a complete procedure which should be done for a case coming to you. Immediate next step in this question answer is ERCP and stone removal. But is it the correct answer? Let me give you one more choice. E, immediate next step, IV fluids and antibiotics. That will be the better answer in this. Immediate next step is IV fluids and antibiotics. Okay, if IV fluids and antibiotics with IV fluid and antibiotic, under this coverage only, I will be doing ERCP and stone removal. So first we put an IV fluid, start antibiotics, shift the patient for ERCP and stone removal will be the correct answer. So you have to very classically form a flow charts for all these type of cases. So these are all known as protocol based questions. So you have to write all the protocols. Protocols in every surgical disease you should know. So Galstone with a stone in the CBD obstruction. What will I do next? I will do an ultrasound. Ultrasound will show you a CBD stone. What will you do next? Confirm it by an MRCP. Once it is showing a stone, what will you do next? So if MRCP shows a stone and patient is having cholangitis, features of cholangitis, put IV fluids plus antibiotics and then I will shift the patient for ERCP plus sphincterotomy and stone removal. If the patient is not having cholangitis, after MRCP, I will directly go for ERC. That is a classical point. If the patient is having cholangitis, I will start IV fluid with antibiotic. Then I will go for ERCP. If MRCP is showing a stone obstruction, but the patient is absolutely stable, we will directly go for ERCP, sphincterotomy and stone removal. Okay. So this is how the questions will be asked in your XC. You can see a video showing you ERCP sphincterotomy being done here. So this is a classical video of we are cutting a sphincter here. You can see we are cutting the sphincter by using a diathermy machine. Sphincter is being getting cut. So observe very closely what you are seeing there is shown in this small X-ray fluoroscopy you are seeing in the other thing. So now as I am cutting the sphincter, you can see the pressure gets decreased. Immediately you can see the stones coming out from the ampulla. That is a classical picture of stones are all abstracted. All stones are getting cleared by using a balloon scope balloon. I am removing all the stones from the ampulla. So this is a classical sphincterotomy and stone removal video. Okay. So after removing that, we will keep a stent inside. So please remember friends, this is the next exam is nothing different. You should not get scared of it. It is a exam which is actually going to simplify your preparation, more clinical oriented, uh, more uh, concept oriented instead of mucking up the facts, instead of writing un unnecessary theory, short notes, etc. Definitely this will make a huge impact in the medical field and it is going to be a huge revolution because this next exam for final years, you are going to get a, a good preparation if you are going to do for the uh, for, for the third third year exams, if you are going to do PAPCA preparation, you are going to crack PG exam, PG entrance also during your final year itself, you can crack the PG also. That is the concept here. So with the next tune, you will not only clear final year, you are going to get a get into the PG also, you are going to get a license to practice. So it is going to be an exam, one exam for one nation, for all people. So definitely it's your road and it's yours alone. Others may walk it with you, but no one can walk it for you. You have to uh, modify yourself, your preparation. You have to uh, uh, you have to tune yourself for the new method of preparation and prepare accordingly. Definitely, you are not going to fail in next. I can assure that in next exam, Indian medical graduates who are going for regular OP posting, attending wards and seeing the patients, you are not going to fail. You are going to definitely pass with the clinical knowledge you are going to acquire in your ward and ward rounds and theater. But getting a good score is it's in your hand only. Getting a good score, you have to get your good score is purely in your hand. You have to uh, get a good score by preparing well. It's up to you whether to pass or to get a PG during your final year itself is up to you. You have to put that much of hard work and prepare sincerely for this uh, six months, which is going to come now. Prepare sincerely. Don't worry whether there will be university exam coming or next is going to come. Prepare according to next. University exam is easier to write theory. theory. We can prepare it near the exam. But as of now, prepare according to next. 
prepare all the clinical topics uh, very good okay so prepare them well thank you i thank the medicine team for providing me an opportunity for uh, producing a small session here thank you raghu i hope uh, we can end the session thank you all thank you all for attending the session sincerely thank you sir thank you so much it thank was a really so eye opening session it was thank really eye opening session and uh, i guess uh, students if they follow these type of uh, protocol based and i think bailey and loud new edition has a lots of changes and we can expect also lots of questions as you told sir thank yeah. you so much sir and the participant you can just uh, conclude thank you so much sir for such a wonderful session and uh, once again on behalf of medicine i thank you uh, very sincerely for taking time out of your busy schedule and i expect more and more uh, lectures from you sir uh, since as i told before it's our 50th live session and you made it very special uh, thank you so much sir thank you patiban thank you so much thank you bhav shall i leave yes sir if you have any doubts you can just post in our group so that we can just get clarified from sir and we can reply you yeah thank you sir thank you so much for joining thank you, thank you, thank you sir